So today's lecture will be about two broad topics that I want to address. I want to talk a bit about technological innovation and how technological innovation happens and how especially technology adoption happens among a broad number or a broad base of people. And I also want to talk a little bit about science fiction. I want to talk about science fiction as a way of thinking about the future, about critically reflecting about the future, about future possibilities, about future scenarios, and also about science fiction as a tool for design processes, as a tool in the toolbox of a designer who's doing interaction design or who's trying to design new modes of interaction and new ways of living with technology. So I think this lecture might be particularly interesting to you if you're a science fiction fan as well. If you're not, then maybe I can still convince you of the value of science fiction as a tool for design processes. But before we get to all that, I first want to take a few minutes to reflect on the title of this lecture, because I think the title of this course of this lecture is actually quite interesting and quite fascinating, and I've spent an enormous amount of time thinking about it and reflecting on it. There are actually two parts that make this title so interesting to me. The first is that most course titles that you come across at university, they actually try to tell you something about the course. They try to tell you something about what the course is actually about. They are usually very descriptive and they are very specific. And this title, the title of this course is very different because it basically doesn't tell you anything about what this whole thing is actually about. It just tells you what it is not about. It just tells you it is not about desktop computing, but it could be about anything else. It could be about knitting or gardening or yoga, and it would still be on topic and it would still fit within the title of this lecture. So I find this quite interesting and I also find it quite liberating because it gives me a lot of freedom and leeway to basically talk about whatever I want. But don't worry, I won't talk about gardening or knitting or yoga because I really don't know anything about those things, but I will talk about technology, of course, because I assume that you're all computer scientists and that's the main thing that you're interested in, obviously. So that's the first thing that I find really interesting about this title, that it doesn't really define itself by describing what the lecture is about, but rather that what it is not about. But there's another interesting thing about this title, and that is this, this term, the desktop, because... Uh, there are actually a lot of different ways to interpret the meaning of this concept of the desktop. There are, I think, three, or to my mind, there are at least three different ways to think about this concept of a desktop. I think you can think of the desktop as an interaction paradigm or as a system metaphor. And that's probably the most obvious, the most literal reading of the intention behind this title. It is about moving beyond the desktop computing paradigm. It's about moving beyond the system metaphor of the desktop that's inherent in so many of our user interface environments that we work with and that we operate in. But I think there are also two other possible and quite interesting interpretations that are connected to this first one. First, I think the desktop could also refer to a specific place, a specific space, like a place for work. If you sit in front of a desk in an office, then you're also in front of a desktop, a work environment. So it could also mean moving beyond this space as a work environment and bringing computing and interaction with computers outside of this business-like office environment into a, a wider world. And then I think there's also a third way to, to think about this concept of the desktop, and that is as a time period, the age of desktop computing as the predominant computing and interaction paradigm. And I want to talk about all three possible interpretations as a kind of introduction to what I'll be getting at later. So first, the desktop as an interaction paradigm. What do I mean when I say the desktop as an interaction paradigm? What's, what's the desktop interaction paradigm? Well, basically it's something like this, something that you see here, something that you're all probably very intimately familiar with. In this case, it's a screenshot from Windows 10. Maybe some of you are using Mac OS, or maybe some of you are using a Linux desktop environment, but all of you are probably very familiar with this kind of operating environment when working with a computer, when interacting with a computer. It's still a cornerstone of how we actually do work when we use a personal computer. And this is actually a very old paradigm. This interaction paradigm of desktop computing has existed for several decades by now. 
And here on this slide you can see probably the first desktop user interface that was ever created. That's a Xerox Alto computer on this slide. And it was developed by Xerox, the photocopier company. Today they are mostly known for their photocopiers. And they built this personal computer and this operating system and graphical user interface for this computer. They built this in the early 1970s and they released this computer together with its operating system and user interface. They released it in 1973. And they didn't actually release it publicly, so you couldn't just go out and buy it. They only released it for institutional buyers. So it was only available to universities and research institutions and the government and the military and stuff like that. But as a private person, you couldn't actually buy this computer. It wasn't available for anyone to buy it. And this computer, the Xerox Alto, is probably the first personal computer that featured a graphical user interface based on the desktop interaction paradigm or based on the desktop system metaphor and it was highly influential it probably influenced all the following desktop computing environments that exist to this day it's a known fact that apple actually visited xerox labs in the 1970s or early 1980s before or during the development of their mac os operating system and even though Apple never actually admitted to this, it's pretty much commonly accepted that Apple copied a lot of those concepts from the Xerox Alto and Xerox Star when they developed their macOS operating system. And then, by extension, Microsoft copied a lot of stuff from Apple. So basically, all those major desktop computing environments that exist today can be traced back to this origin of the Xerox Alto in the 1970s. And if you look at this screenshot on the right side of the screen, you can see that there are a lot of concepts in here that are actually still a part of today's desktop environments. You have stuff like windows that can overlap each other, so you can drag one window on top of another and the window in the background will be partly obscured. You have buttons with icons on them that you can click to do some operation. You have what you see is what you get editing. You have mechanisms for window manipulation like window resizing and scrolling and stuff like that. So a lot of the concepts that still exist today and that we use every day when we use a Windows computer or a Mac basically go back to this idea from the 1970s of the Xerox Alto. So in a sense, you could say that these ideas are actually quite old. The next major milestone in desktop computing environments was probably macOS released by Apple in 1984, 11 years after the Alto. And that was the first commercially successful desktop user interface. So there were others before that. For example, Apple also released the Apple Lisa in 1983, but that was a commercial failure. And Xerox released the Xerox Star in 1981, but that was also a commercial failure. And the Mac, the original Macintosh from 1984 with the first version of macOS, that was probably the first successful desktop computing environment that people could buy and take home and use every day to do their work. So basically these concepts of a desktop environment are actually quite old. They go back 50 years. They've been commercially available for more than 35 years. So in that sense, it of course makes sense to have this ambition to go beyond this interaction paradigm, to move beyond this system metaphor of a desktop environment because it's quite, quite old and maybe there are better ways to do things, better ways to enable interaction with a computer. But at the same time, I think it's also important to point out that, of course, the desktop environments that we have today, if we look at something like Windows 10 or Mac OS X, that those environments have evolved since then. So they are much more advanced and they are much more evolved and feature-rich compared to what existed back in the 1970s. So on the one hand we have concepts that are quite old and maybe even dusty, but at the same time it's not like things stood still and nothing happened, but there has been a lot of progress over the decades to improve and refine these desktop environments and they work very very well and that's probably why we still use them today because they have matured very well and they are now at a point where they just work for their intended purpose. So I think that's one way, as I said, to think about this concept of the desktop that we are trying to move beyond. The next way that you can think about this concept of the desktop is the desktop as a space, as I said. The desktop as a physical space where work is done. The 
desk in front of you when you sit down to do work, where you place your laptop and where your desktop computer is placed and where you make notes and you do office stuff. And for a long time, most personal computing happened in this environment. So if you look at the earliest desktop computers that were released on the market, those were machines, those were devices that were intended for desk-bound office work. They were intended for desk-bound use. They were meant to be used in a business-like office environment for a serious business office work. And if you look at the, the desktop user interfaces that we have today, today, those desktop user interfaces actually borrow a lot of the concepts from the pre-existing physical office environment that existed before those graphical user interfaces existed. For example, today you still have things like documents and files that you can move around on your computer and you can organize those documents and files inside folders like you would do with a paper folder. You have a trash can where you throw stuff away like you probably have a trash can next to your desk where you also put all the paper that you no longer need. You have the metaphor of a clipboard where you can put information that you want to take with you, that you want to move from one application to another. So a lot of those concepts that we find in desktop user interfaces are actually very literal translations of concepts that existed before computers in the pre-existing physical office environments. So in that sense, moving beyond the desktop can also mean moving outside this space, this office space, moving away from the desk as the only place where computing happens and as the only place where work happens. And of course that could mean taking computing pretty much anywhere, for example, to a place like this. And this has been a popular idea among scientists and among researchers and innovators to think about ways to take computing out of the office environment, out of the business environment, into the rest of the real world, into the rest of the physical world. And one of the first prominent voices that introduced this idea on a somewhat broader basis was a man named Mark Weiser. And Mark Weiser was a scientist, he was also at Xerox Park, and he did a lot of work in the early 1990s. And during that time he coined the term of ubiquitous computing, or the idea, the concept of ubiquitous computing that is still with us today. And the idea of ubiquitous computing, or Mark Weiser's idea of ubiquitous computing, was that it will help overcome the problem of information overload. And he used the example that there is more information at our fingertips during a walk in the woods than in any computer system, yet people find a walk among trees relaxing and computers frustrating. So that was his big vision of ubiquitous computing, to take computing out of the office, to take it out of the technological domain and to put it everywhere, to put it everywhere in the world. And they tried a lot of things back then at Xerox Park with their research, for example. Here you can see a photo of Mark Weiser and his team at Xerox where they are working with early prototypes of this idea of ubiquitous computing. And these early prototypes, they consisted of three fundamental parts of three fundamental components. They consisted of so-called tabs, and those tabs are those small white plastic things on the table. Uh, the idea was that those are the smallest computing units in this environment, and they are basically kind of like a post-it note where you scribble something down or they hold a small amount of information. And the second component were so-called pads, and those are the things that the people here in the chairs are holding in their lap here. And those pads are basically like our tablets that we have today. They are like an early day precursor of our iPads and Android tablets and Surface tablets and so on. And the idea here was to have these pen-controlled computing devices that are about as large as the size of paper, where most of the interaction and most of the work with these computing environments actually happens. And then the third component was something like this large screen here in the background, they called those boards, and those were meant to be shared working spaces, kind of like a presentation that you do on a beamer, on a video beamer, or on a large screen TV, or something like that. So those were the three parts that they developed for this ecosystem of ubiquitous computing, this ecosystem prototype, if you will. And I think it's quite fascinating to look at these components, because if you look at these, they're very similar to what we actually have today, because those pads, those smallest units, those are very comparable to our modern-day smartphones. They are like the smallest units of computing that you can work with in a 
meaningful way and they're kind of like uh, as far as size and intended usage is concerned they're kind of similar to what we have with our modern day smartphones and then these so-called pads they're very similar to the tablets that we have they're very similar to the iPads and Android tablets that exist today and those large screens, of course, they're very similar to any environment where you typically give a presentation and where you have a video beam or a large screen TV. So basically, in some sense, today, 30 years later, we are living in a reality that has manifested all these different parts of this original vision of ubiquitous computing, as Mark Weiser imagined it back in the 1990s. But there is one important difference in this original concept of Mark Weiser, or maybe it's not such a big difference, but one interesting part of this vision that Mark Weiser also described was his idea was that these devices that you see littered around here in the room, these devices, they would be disposable. They wouldn't be personal devices. They wouldn't be things that you buy and that you value and that you treasure and that you keep to yourself. They would be so pervasive and they would be so ubiquitous that they would be basically just strewn around the environment and if you need a computer you just pick it up because they're just lying everywhere and your personal information would be readily available on every of these computer systems because they would be synchronized with some kind of network solution in the background. And once again, I think we can see that this kind of disposability, or at least this kind of multi-device ecosystem, is already manifesting itself today, because today it's also quite, quite easy and quite feasible, and a lot of you probably do this regularly, and I know that I do this regularly, that you move from one device to another. You, you start doing something on your smartphone, and then you get home and get in front of your computer, and you can just pick up on your computer whatever you did on your smartphone before, because all your data is synced in the cloud anyway. So in that way, this idea of disposable devices that are not strictly personal, but rather they are interchangeable and with a, a data trail that just follows you around wherever you go, this idea is also starting to manifest itself quite, quite strongly already. However, Mark Weiser was critical of his own work because in retrospect he also said that our prototypes have sometimes succeeded but more often failed to be invisible. So in that sense, Mark Weiser conceded that he didn't succeed in his original vision of ubiquitous computing. His original vision of ubiquitous computing was to create computing environments that don't demand the attention of their users and that would be like floating in the ambience and they would be non-monopolizing and that he didn't succeed in. Once again, I think we can see that this is something that also hasn't manifested in our current day reality because a lot of those devices that we have, they don't blend into the background and a lot of them demand our full attention and they take us out of the world and into the environment of the device itself. So that's, I think, the second interesting way to think about this idea of moving beyond the desktop. Moving beyond the desktop as a physical environment, as a physical space. Moving away from the desktop as a place where work happens out into other parts of the world. Okay, so the third interesting interpretation of this title, I think, is to think of the desktop as a time period, if you will. And more specifically, as the time period of desktop computing's dominance. And for a long time, I think it's fair to say that desktop computing and desktop environments were the predominant paradigm in personal computing, at least when it came to interacting with computers. And again, this probably lasted for maybe 30 or 40 years from the Xerox Alto to Windows 8. So if we want to move beyond that, then we could say it's about trying to escape the boundaries of the desktop as a system metaphor, but also as a physical environment and to move into a new age where computing is freed from these limitations. But at the same time, if we also look at this time period and at other technological innovations that happened during that time, then you will see that even during those decades where desktop computing was the predominant interaction paradigm in personal computing, there were a lot of technologies and a lot of efforts and some very successful technologies actually that already did exactly that. They already did move beyond the desktop as a paradigm and as a physical space. So even then, it's not exactly a clear cut or it's not that easy to say that it's a new thing to move away from the desktop as a paradigm and as a physical space. At the same time, I think it's also quite interesting to look at recent developments over the past few years, because if you look at the spread of technologies like smartphones and tablets, then it becomes very obvious that we are actually now in a time period, that we are now in an age 
where we have already moved beyond desktop computing as the predominant paradigm of personal computing. The most important or the most successful computing platforms in our world today are mobile platforms like iOS and Android. I mean, if you look at this graph, it ends in December 2015, but even then there were about 3 billion iOS and Android devices on Earth and only about 1.5 billion desktop computers. And the crossover point was sometime in the second half of 2013. So in that sense, uh, this vision of moving beyond the desktop has already materialized. It's already our reality. It's already our lived reality that we exist in. Yet, at the same time, desktop computing, of course, hasn't gone away. So even if you concede that desktop computers are no longer the predominant paradigm, they are still massively important and they are still used and they are still useful. So it's not like smartphones have eradicated the need for desktop computing, but they have found their own place next to it and desktop computing still exists. So maybe that means that there's actually no need at all to move beyond desktop computing because it's obviously no threat to competing paradigms and there's obviously still use to be found. Maybe we shouldn't even ask this question of moving beyond the desktop. To me, it's really quite mind-boggling. If you think about it, iOS and Android didn't even exist before 2007. The first iPhone was launched in 2007. The first Android smartphones were launched in 2007. So before 2007, those technologies didn't even exist. And within six years, they managed to become more widespread among people than desktop computers. And they did something in six years that took desktop computers decades. I, I think that's just a really great illustration of rapid and of massive technological change and widespread technological change within just eight years. But as I said, this success of the smartphone as the new dominant computing platform hasn't supplanted the need for desktop computing entirely. And this always reminds me of a great quote by the author William Gibson. Maybe you've heard of him. William Gibson is a Canadian science fiction author. He wrote the book Neuromancer in the 1980s. He's one of the big cyberpunk authors. He's probably one of the founders of the cyberpunk movement, if you so will. And he's also the inventor of the term cyberspace. So if you've ever heard of the word cyberspace, William Gibson, that's the guy who invented it. And William Gibson said, the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. And I think that's a very interesting way of thinking about the future. And also a very interesting way of thinking about how technological change and technological progress and innovation actually happens. And once again, I think there are actually two ways to understand this quote or this sentence. I think one way to interpret it, probably the more obvious way, is to think about it in global geographical terms. For example, that there are differences in between regions and continents and nations that are industrialized and economically well developed and they have better infrastructure and they have better access to new technologies compared to countries that are poorer or are not quite as developed. So that's probably one way to look at this, and a, a perfectly legitimate way to look at this quote. But I don't think it's the only way to, to look at this sentence and to understand it, because those differences don't just manifest themselves on a global geographical level, they also manifest themselves on a very small scale level. We don't have to look very far across the globe to find technological differences. We just have to look around. We really don't have to look very far. For example, something like broadband internet connectivity. You can very easily get a really good and really cheap broadband internet connectivity in a city like Vienna. But if you are somewhere in a place more rural in Austria, and I know this from my parents, they're living in a rather remote location, in a rather remote rural location. Where they live, it's practically impossible to get a decent broadband internet connection because there's just no infrastructure there. So even within one country and within one economic environment, there are massive differences in the availability of different technologies. And that brings me to the next part or the next big topic of this lecture, because next I want to look at how technological innovation spreads or how it happens and how it's adopted by different people. So there's, there's a model that tries to explain this phenomenon that technological adoption doesn't happen uniformly among a populace or among people, but rather that there are different stages of technology adoption and that those stages of technology adoption can be explained by 
different behaviors of different target groups. And this technology adoption lifecycle basically separates people into these five groups, these five buckets that you see here on this slide. So basically you have a very small group of innovators and those are the people that will jump on board with any new technology as soon as possible and as soon as it becomes available. And those are people who don't just use technology and who don't just consume technology, but who very often actively shape new technologies. Those are the innovators and the hackers and the tinkerers and the scientists and the researchers and people who just like playing with new technology as soon as it becomes available. But that's a very, very small minority of the overall population. And then there's the next group, the early adopters, and those are people who just try to be at the forefront of new technologies. Those are people who just actively seek out new technological developments, and those are the people who just buy anything that's new and who can't wait to get their next iPhone every year, and they always just have to have the newest stuff. And then the next group are the early majority, and if you will, those are people who need a little bit more convincing, but not a whole lot. Those are people who are not actively seeking new technologies, but they don't need a lot of convincing to try out something new, and they, they are generally probably pretty open to new technologies and to trying out new things and they will get on the bandwagon pretty early. And then on the other half of this graph you have those who need more convincing, maybe even a lot more convincing, like the late majority, and those are people who probably take more of a wait and see approach. They, they first want to see that a new technology actually works, that it's useful, that it's reliable, that there are no threats if you pick up this technology, that there are no risky downsides in adopting it. And then when a technology has sufficiently matured and they are sufficiently convinced that this is actually a good thing, then they will get on the bandwagon and also adopt this new technology. And then the last group, the laggards, you could say those are the people who actively resist technological change. Those are people who don't want new technology in their lives and who will go out of their way to avoid it at all costs, if at all possible. And those are the people who will probably only pick up a new technology when there's no other way, when there's just no alternative, when there's no avoiding it. Like, for example, if the revenue service forces you to do your tax statements online, then obviously you need internet and then you force people to actually get an internet connection. Or in our time where a lot of stuff is just happening online, where you need an internet connection or where you need to be online in order to book a flight or to book a table at a restaurant or to get the opening hours of a store and stuff like that. That's basically the moment where you can't any longer resist this development and you just have to get on board. So basically what I'm trying to get at here is that technologies are not adopted at once. There are also differences in personality, differences in people that make them more or less likely to adopt a new technology. And I think this is something that's often overlooked when dealing with technological innovation, especially on the side of innovators and inventors who are trying to change the world with their new inventions. Because technological change, especially technological change on a massive scale, doesn't happen from one day to the next. It doesn't happen overnight. And I think this is beautifully illustrated in this chart here. And in this chart, you can see how different technologies were adopted over the course of the 20th and early 21st century. And two comments to contextualize this a bit. This chart plots the technology adoption rate between a 10% to a 90% household penetration rate. So we are not talking about technology adoption on an individual level, on a per person level, we are talking about technology adoption on a household level. Because for a lot of these technologies, an individual level doesn't even make sense because not every person needs to buy their own fridge. It's perfectly sufficient if you buy one fridge for one household and stuff like that, or one TV for one household. And the other thing that's worth pointing out, this chart is only for the United States, but the United States are, are a pretty big market, so, so, uh, so I think it's still quite interesting and quite instructive to observe this. And if we look at this chart, we can see that a lot of these technologies actually took years, if not decades, to reach uh, or to go from 10% adoption to 90% adoption rate. For example, some things that really stand out to me, something like the telephone, it took 73 years, more than seven decades, more than a typical lifetime, I guess, to go from 10% adoption to 90% adoption. And for something like the personal computer, if you look at the personal computer that's been going for three or four decades and it still hasn't reached 90% adoption rate. 
And at the same time, if you look at some of the more successfully adopted technologies in this chart, I think it's quite interesting and revealing that a lot of them are intended for communication and for media consumption purposes. I mean, really outstanding. The television just took 13 years to go from 10 to 90 percent adoption. That's, that's just incredibly fast. And the radio also very fast, just 23 years from 10 to 90 percent adoption. The cell phone incredibly fast, 14 years from 10 to 90 percent. And the only utility in this chart that was actually quite quick, and I find this quite telling as well, was the refrigerator, which also only took 24 years to reach 90% adoption. And I think this is telling us about something, how useful a refrigerator actually is. But the true standout technology in all this, to me, is still the smartphone, which only took eight years to go from 10% adoption rate to 90% adoption rate. It's by far the fastest adopted technology of all of those that you see in here in this chart. And this view of technology adoption is actually quite interesting and quite useful because a lot of technologies actually get more useful with increasing adoption for two different reasons. The first of those reasons are, of course, economies of scale. If more people start buying into a new technology, then there is more money to be made, and that money can be invested in research, it can be invested in development, and it can be invested in manufacturing efficiency, and thus the technology gets better and cheaper at the same time. And this is, of course, a, a virtuous circle where the technology keeps getting better, it keeps getting cheaper, more people keep buying in because it's cheaper and better and that money can be reinvested in the further development of this technology. So that's a very, a very, very good, very virtuous cycle to drive not just adoption but the technology itself forward. And once again I think this is very obvious if you look at something like the smartphone because if you take any modern day smartphone that you can buy today and compare it to the smartphones that existed 10 or 12 years ago, then every smartphone that you buy today is both much cheaper and much better than anything you could buy just 12 years ago. And then the other thing where technology adoption plays a big role in making technologies more useful is, of course, in infrastructure. Because a lot of these technologies obviously don't exist in isolation. They require infrastructure and they build on other technologies that came before them. So for example, for a fridge to be useful, you first need to have electricity in the household. Or for a smartphone to be truly useful, you obviously need battery technology to power it, you need cellular internet connectivity to connect it to the internet, you need an app ecosystem to extend the functionality with new apps that you can download. You need all that progress in software development and in software design and in user interface design to actually make these complex devices accessible and usable. You need all the progress in digital photography to make the cameras as good as they are. So these technologies, they don't exist in isolation, but they build on all that has come before. And very often we also rely on critical infrastructure to function at all. And for that infrastructure to be built out and to make sense to build that infrastructure out, of course you need a certain amount of adoption. For example, if you think of a technology like the car, for a car to be useful you need a network of roads where you can drive on. And you need an infrastructure of gas stations where you can fill up the tank with gasoline in order to keep your car running. And you, for example, also need a complex legal framework that regulates how people are supposed to behave when they are driving their car in public because otherwise people would just cause accidents and kill themselves or kill others. So you need a lot of infrastructure in built infrastructure, but also, for example, legal infrastructure for technologies to actually work. And this kind of infra infrastructure can only be built if there is sufficient adoption of a new technology to justify the investments in this kind of infra infrastructure. But the main point that I'm trying to get at is technological change doesn't just happen from one day to the next. It doesn't happen overnight, but it can take many, many, many years, sometimes or often even decades. So that's, I think, something to keep in mind. Um, there's also a great quote that's kind of connected to this theme by Roy Amara. And Roy Amara once said, we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. Bill Gates also once said something very similar. He said, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. So basically both of them say, we as technologists, we as people building new technologies, inventing new technologies, 
we tend to overestimate the short-term benefits and also to underestimate the long-term benefits that can manifest itself on a longer time scale. And I think a lot of that has to do with this kind of technology adoption life cycle or with those long time spans and those phases of infrastructure building and of cultural and societal absorption of a new technology that a lot of people who are just working on the technology itself are kind of ignoring or maybe not fully aware of and that leads to this kind of thing. Another model that expresses this idea, I think, very well is the Gartner Hype Cycle. Maybe you've already heard of it at some point. The Gartner Hype Cycle is basically a, a model of, if you will, technological enthusiasm, of technological hype developed by the consulting company Gartner. And I should probably mention that this Gartner Hype Cycle is not without its critics and it's somewhat controversial because it's not very methodologically sound from a scientific perspective. It's kind of like more a management consulting tool, but if you apply scientific scrutiny to this kind of thing, it doesn't really hold up. And they always like to release new versions of their Hype Cycle where they place different technologies along this line that you can see here in this graph. And usually those technologies just make wild and completely random jumps along this cycle. So it's really not very well explained how they develop their predictions and how they adjust the predictions. But I personally think the basic idea underlying this Hype Cycle is actually quite a good one and quite a sound one. Because basically the idea behind this hype cycle is that at the start you have a technology trigger. That's when a new technology is beginning to break into the mainstream, when it reaches a certain critical mass that people become aware of it outside of academia and outside of the scientific community. And then when this trigger happens, when people become aware of it, the hype sets in. And that's when people just keep piling new and new and new expectations on top of new, new technology. The press and investors and, and the public and everyone, everyone just goes on how great this new thing is and how it will change the world and how it will save your life and how nothing will be as it was ever before. And this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, if you will. Until it reaches a peak, until this hype reaches a peak, the peak of inflated expectations. And that's the peak where a lot of people suddenly realize well, this technology actually isn't as great as everyone has been saying, and there are also downsides and negative effects of this technology. And that's when the backlash usually sets in. That's something that's also usually very, very prominent in the press when the media starts writing negative articles about the new technology. And then basically this hype for a new technology goes down into this area of this graph that's called the trough of disillusionment. And that's basically when, when the enthusiasm for a new technology, the hype surrounding a new technology, reaches its low and where it bottoms out and where most people just forget about it and go on with their life. And some people still keep at it and stick with it and they then actually work on making it actually useful. And that's this less steep slope here at the end. And I think if you look at a lot of technologies, then you can see a very similar pattern emerge to this Gartner hype cycle. For me, one of the most illustrative examples for this is Google Glass. I think you probably all know about Google Glass. Google Glass was a project by Google a couple of years ago where they basically developed a heads-up augmented reality display. It wasn't really an augmented reality, but it was a set of glasses with a small display area in front of the eyes so that you could always look at this display area in front of your eyes, a heads-up display, and with very limited touch controls and with some voice recognition, voice control software integrated and with a camera. And Google spent a lot of time and a lot of effort in promoting and hyping this new technology. I mean, they had one of their developers jump out of an airplane at the Google Developer Conference and land in front of the conference hall with Google Glass, and they were live streaming this paracute jump with Google Glass to all the developers in the hall. And they did a fashion show with Diane von Fürstenberg where all the models were wearing Google Glasses on the runway. So a lot of sometimes quite ridiculous publicity stunts to promote this new technology. And at first the press and the media was lapping this up and they were hyping this technology to the heavens and everyone was talking about this is the future and in a few years everyone will run around with a heads-up display like that and stuff like that. 
And then quite a short while afterwards, just a few months, I think, or maybe a year, the backlash set in and it set in really violently because suddenly there were all those articles that stated that people who were wearing those things, they were rude and they were disrespectful of other people and they were invading the privacy of other people by taking photographs of them without them noticing and there were reports of actual violent physical assaults on, on people who were wearing these glasses. So it was really, I think, a, an extraordinary backlash against this new technology. And then it just kind of disappeared and no one was talking about it. And I think this is a prime example of how this Gartner hype cycle plays out with massive expectations and massive hype at the beginning, then a very violent backlash and everyone rejecting this new technology. And then it just kind of disappears and people start working on it in earnest and let's see where it goes. Okay, but a lot of what I've been talking about now has been about the technology adoption that happens once a new technology actually enters the market. And I also want to take a step back and look at what happens before this technology trigger moment, before a new technology actually enters the public discourse or the public perception, if you will. And this is something that Bill Buxton has described in his work and in his article, and this is something that he has called the long nose of innovation. Bill Buxton is a researcher at, at Microsoft Research, and he's also very, very established in the scientific community and the HCI community as a researcher with many decades of experience. And he basically said that for any new technology to get to a point where it has any chance of actually reaching the market and becoming useful, it takes a really long gestation period, a really long time of basic and fundamental research and development in the lab before you even get to a point where you can think about bringing this new technology into the market. And basically he said, any technology that is going to have a significant impact over the next 10 years is already at least 10 years old. And that doesn't mean that this technology has already existed in its final shape and form for 10 years, but that the basic concepts and the, the basic workings of this technology are known or knowable to those in the field, to those who care to look. And I think this is also quite interesting because it means if we want to think about new technological developments, we don't have to start at the beginning, but rather we can look at what's actually happening in the scientific environment or in the scientific communities, what's happening inside the scientific research labs and what kind of technologies are brewing there to get a very good idea of where we might be going over the next 10 years and what kind of technologies will have an impact over the future. And if we take a look at a number of examples, you can see this play out so, so many times in the history of computing technology. For example, something like hypertext. I mean, if you want to, you could probably trace the origins of hypertext back even further, but I think a lot of people agree that the formative moment for hypertext as the concept exists today is an essay that was published by Vannevar Bush in 1945 in the Atlantic Monthly. And this essay was titled As We May Think. And in this article, he described a system where documents could be directly linked with each other and the reader of those documents would be able to follow those links from one document to the next. So that probably sounds very familiar to you because that's basically how the World Wide Web works today. But of course in 1945 a lot of digital technology didn't even exist at that point. So this contraption that Vannevar Bush was describing was actually a mechanical apparatus where documents stored on microfilm were mechanically transported and connected to each other and that people could read in this mechanical desk contraption that would show them those documents stored on microfilm. And this idea was probably never feasible. It would probably have been impossible to actually build this thing that he was describing in this article. But it caught the imagination of a lot of scientists and of a lot of people, and it influenced them to start working on actually building this idea. One of those people was Ted Nelson, who in the 1960s came up with the concept of Sanadu, which is probably one of the more famous hypertext systems. And it's not just famous, it's probably also infamous and quite tragic because Ted Nelson never managed to actually build his system. He also invented the term hypertext, by the way. 
So basically, Ted Nelson tried to build his idea of an ideal hypertext system for decades. I think he was still on it like in 2012. He failed to materialize his vision of a hypertext system for five decades. So this is actually a very tragic story, a very tragic story of failure, if you will. But he did a lot of publicity for the concept of hypertext, and he laid out a lot of the foundational vision that would lead to the hypertext systems that we have today. And then in 1968, Douglas Engelbart probably introduced one of the first, if not the first, actual working hypertext systems that ever existed as part of his mother of all demos. You can see a screenshot of this system and of Douglas Engelbart in the top right corner of this slide. And I, I just have to point out at this point that if you ever feel like learning something about HCI history and if you ever want to see one of the greatest and most important moments of HCI history of the 20th century, then just go on YouTube and search for the mother of all demos by Douglas Engelbart and watch that video because that was just mind-blowingly foundational. There are so many incredible new concepts introduced in that demo. You have stuff like live video conferencing, you have stuff like collaborative online document editing, you have a working hypertext environment, you have the first computer mouse that ever existed and stuff like that. So basically in those two hours and 20 minutes you can basically see a lot of the concepts that massively influenced the next 50 years of how human-computer interaction developed and played out. And then there were other quite successful hypertext systems. For example, Apple introduced the HyperCard in, in 1987. It was massively popular back then, but it had one incredible shortcoming because it was not connected. It was not networked. It was isolated on your own personal computer. And this shortcoming was solved in 1990 by Tim Berners-Lee with the invention of the World Wide Web. And of course, you all know of the World Wide Web and we are using it daily and we are using it now. So that's basically the moment where this vision of a hypertext system reached its full potential and where it was fully realized and where it finally reached a point where it could actually make a difference in the world. Or you can also say the same for the computer mouse. Again, the first computer mouse was also invented by Douglas Engelbart and also demonstrated as part of this mother of all demos in 1968. And the first ball mouse, that was the first mouse that used one of those little balls for motion tracking was invented a few years later, nine years later, by Bill English. Bill English was also a colleague of Douglas Engelbart who collaborated with him on the invention of the first mouse. But those devices never really achieved mainstream success simply because there weren't any computer environments available that required them. Back then, most computers had command line interfaces and there simply wasn't a real use case for the computer mouse to exist. People just didn't need them. And this all changed in the early 1980s with the introduction of the first Microsoft mouse and with the introduction of the first Macintosh and macOS and then also in 1985 with the introduction of Windows 1.0. And that was basically the moment when people started to buy a computer mouse and when they started using a computer mouse. And it's really quite funny because if you dig down in the archives of the New York Times, you can find articles from the early 1980s in the New York Times where people were arguing that the computer mouse was just a useless toy and that real professional computer users don't need a computer mouse because they can do everything with their keyboard and this thing will never catch on. So in hindsight, quite funny to read if you dig that kind of stuff out today. But again, 20 years from invention to mass adoption in the market. Or something like touchscreens. The first basic touchscreens existed in the 1960s and 1970s, and there was a lot of effort in the 1990s and early 2000s by companies like Palm and also by Microsoft with their early tablet PCs to bring touchscreen computing into the mainstream, to establish it as an alternative to mouse and keyboard interaction. But those never really caught on, and I think it's fair to say that the one device that really drove touchscreen adoption on a very broad basis was the iPhone when it introduced its multi-touch interaction and the multi-touch screens in 2007. And ever since, touchscreens are a cornerstone of how we interact with modern day computers and tablets and smartphones. Or something like virtual reality. You can trace the first prototypes of virtual reality once again back to the 1960s. 1968 obviously was a very productive year in human computer interaction if you will. And basically the idea was known since the 1960s and there have been many many forgotten failures <laughs> or forgotten failed attempts to commercialize virtual reality. For example, if you look in the 1990s, a lot of research and a lot of development was done on virtual reality in the 1990s. Nintendo 
released their own virtual reality video gaming system and it was a spectacular failure. I mean, I think the Nintendo Virtual Boy is probably the only forgotten Nintendo console that they ever did. All, all others were more or less successful, but that was just a massive failure. And then in 2012 with the Oculus Rift there was another massive boom surrounding virtual reality technology. And I wouldn't say that it had been a massive success because it's not like there are hundreds of millions of virtual reality headsets sold to date, but I believe the numbers are in the high millions by now, so I guess you could argue that we're probably slowly getting somewhere with virtual reality technology adoption. Or another example, a final example, stuff like voice assistants and chatbots and natural language processing. The basic idea for all this goes back to Alan Turing and this idea of a Turing test where, where basically the idea was that you could test a general artificial intelligence by letting a human being chat with another entity without letting him know whether it's a person or a computer and if the computer can fool the human being into thinking that he's talking to a human then we are dealing with general artificial intelligence. And another big breakthrough in that area was in 1966 by Joseph Weizenbaum, who developed ELISA, which is probably the first chatbot that ever existed. That's probably the first chatbot that you could talk to. You see a screenshot of that in the top right corner. And Joseph Weizenbaum in his later years was actually very critical of this concept, of this idea, because he was actually quite scared by this idea of developing machines that engage humans on this emotional level. And I think he kind of regretted actually going in that direction, building that kind of thing. And then, of course, you also have stuff from fiction, like Star Trek, if you remember. The original Star Trek series with William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy, they also had this kind of voice assistant. They just talked to the computer and they had this kind of voice assistant-like interface that's very similar to what we have today when we buy an Apple HomePod or Amazon Alexa or a Google Home device, stuff like that. So... A lot of technologies take a lot of time to actually reach a point where they are sufficiently mature to enter the market. And even once they have entered the market, it can still take years and decades for them to reach mass adoption, where you can say that everyone has access. So I'm going to conclude this part about innovation. And now I want to get back to what I announced in the beginning, to science fiction. Science fiction as a tool for thinking about the future and as a tool in the toolbox of a designer. And I think science fiction is a useful way to think about these long-term technological developments. Because if we accept that this kind of technological adoption and dissemination takes so long, takes years and decades, then of course it raises the question, how can we possibly think about these kind of developments in a constructive and in a useful way. And I think science fiction is one possible approach to address this challenge. And I think one great example of how science fiction can influence human-computer interaction, probably the best example that I can think of, is the movie Minority Report. So Minority Report is a science fiction movie by Steven Spielberg starring Tom Cruise, as you can see in this picture, as you probably recognize him. And it was released in 2002. And Steven Spielberg's idea for this movie was to craft a convincing depiction of what the year 2054 might look like. And to achieve this goal, to achieve this goal of depicting a believable and realistic vision of the future, he invited a group of 15 people to form a think tank, to brainstorm about what the future might look like. Those were people from all kinds of different professional backgrounds. Those were computer scientists and they were architects and sociologists and technologists and people from media and just a, a large and diverse group of people who spent their time thinking and inventing the future. And this worked, I think, really well because I think this movie is very good in crafting a believable vision of what the future might look like. But I think the most prominent part of this movie and the most lasting legacy of this movie is probably the scene where Tom Cruise interacts with his policing computer. And this idea of interacting with the computer was just incredibly convincing because basically whenever today you read about anyone doing something similar, this kind of gestural interaction with a computing system, 
it's always compared to this movie. Every press article and every posting about this kind of technology, if you read technology weblogs and magazines and stuff like that, they always compare every kind of gestural interface to this movie because this movie, Minority Report, and this scene in the movie has established itself as the definitive frame of reference for any kind of gestural interaction with a computer. I mean, just give it a try, put Minority Report style interface into Google and you will find a lot of stuff. And it's also quite interesting because a lot of researchers who are working in this area cite or mention this movie as a specific inspiration in their work that basically got them on track to try to explore these kinds of things. So the next thing I want to talk about is the different roles and purposes that science fiction can serve as a design tool or in a development process or generally, maybe even generally, the different kinds of purposes or the different kinds of understandings for science fiction that exist. And I think one of the most common understandings of science fiction is that the purpose of science fiction is for prediction. And so, so basically that science fiction is about making predictions about the future, making predictions about things that will happen. And Roy Bradbury once said something to this effect, who said that science fiction is basically like putting two and two together and extrapolating a projection of the future to predict what will happen in the future. And I think that's one way to look at science fiction, but I actually think it's probably the least useful way to view science fiction as a tool for thinking and for critical reflection. Because, as another famous person, in this case Niels Bohr, allegedly said, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. So, basically, prediction is always unreliable. You can never be sure that you'll be right or wrong. You can never rely on predictions. So it's very unstable, it's highly speculative, it's very unreliable, and thus it's just, I think, not really very useful. A tool that isn't reliable just isn't very useful. And of course you can keep making predictions and predictions and predictions and eventually some of them will be right, but usually a lot of them will be wrong and the only advantage is that those that are wrong are usually very quickly forgotten, so in the end you can still claim that you were right. But as a tool in the here and now, without hindsight, I think science fiction as a tool for prediction is of very limited use and of very limited value. But Thankfully, prediction is not the only purpose that science fiction can serve in the design process because these science fiction depictions also have this effect of inspiring people. Peter Calthorpe, who is an architect who was also part of this Minority Report consulting think tank, he said that when entertainment frames the future, it becomes a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, simply because these visions of the future, once they enter the, the, the collective mindset of a lot of people, once they reach a critical mass of people who have seen these depictions of the future, they become very inspiring and they become something for people to work towards, that they can try to move towards. And this is something that also two scientists, Durish and Bell, observed who said that science fiction does not merely anticipate but actively shape technological futures through its effect on the collective imagination. So I think that's actually a much more useful way of using science fiction as a tool in design. Not as a tool for prediction, but rather as a tool for inspiration and as a tool to establish a vision. And there are many examples of where reality basically follows those fictitious depictions of technology. As I said, Minority Report, we basically have some very similar concepts today in video games with motion controls on the Nintendo Wii or with the Xbox Kinect. Or if we look at something like those voice assistants that are selling very well right now, uh, like Amazon Alexa and Google Home and stuff like that. Basically, you have very similar concepts if you go back to the 1960s to Star Trek, as I already talked about before. Or if you look at something like tablet computers, there are also very early depictions of this kind of technology in movies. You see here on the left side a still from the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey by Stanley Kubrick from 1968. And if you compare this scene from the movie 2001 from 1968 with the picture on the right that's just a Creative Commons picture that I grabbed off Flickr, it's just astonishing to me to observe those parallels and the similarities in those scenes. And maybe you remember that Samsung was sued by Apple a couple of years ago for 
trademark or copyright infringement because Apple felt that Samsung was violating their intellectual property and they were suing them because of that. And Samsung actually entered stills from this movie, from the movie 2001 and in a, a Space Odyssey, into the evidence for that court trial because they claimed prior art based on that movie. They basically were saying Apple didn't invent the iPad, Apple didn't invent all this. Stanley Kubrick actually came up with this stuff way before in 1968. So I think that's a really interesting anecdote in, in that regard. And then you have stuff like Google Glass, which I've also talked about before, where you can find very similar concepts in movies like Robocop or Terminator. And this kind of heads-up display overlay that Google Glass is using that's also very often called in the media and in the press Terminator Vision. So once again, a reference to a popular movie is made to establish this kind of frame of reference for a reader who is not familiar with this technology so that he can understand how that stuff is supposed to work. And if you're interested in these kind of similarities, I have a book recommendation for you, a book by Nathan Shadroff and Chris Nessel, Make It So Learning from Science Fiction, and basically that's just a book full of this kind of case studies where parallels between fictional depictions of technology and the real manifestation of these technologies is compared. Really quite interesting. So science fiction can be a very useful tool for inspiration, and this is also something that large companies are using to their advantage and to good effect. For example, Apple did so, and I would like to show you an example of how Apple basically used a science fiction video to inspire its workforce and as a marketing tool. I'm only showing you a part of it, and it was produced in 1987, three years after the release of the original Macintosh computer. Research team in Guatemala just checking in. Robert Jordan, a second semester junior, requesting a second extension on his term paper. And your mother reminding you about your father's surprise birthday party next Sunday. Today you have a faculty lunch at 12 o'clock. You need to take Kathy to the airport by 2. You have a lecture at 4.15 on deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. Right. Let me see the lecture notes from last semester. No, that's not enough. I need to review more recent literature. Pull up all the new articles I haven't read yet. Journal articles only? Mm hmm fine. Your friend Jill Gilbert has published an article about deforestation in the Amazon and its effects on rainfall in the Sub-Sahara. It also covers drought's effect on food production in Africa and increasing imports of food. Contact Jill. I'm sorry, she's not available right now. I left a message that you had called. Okay. Let's see. So, again, I think it's quite interesting how there are many similarities between the technologies depicted in this video and more recent technological developments because you basically can see the similarities with stuff that Apple built decades later with stuff like Siri, the voice assistant interface where you can just talk to your smartphone in natural language and it just understands you. That, that's basically also in this video in the shape of this personal assistant that you can just give commands to and he will do them on your behalf. And this weird plasticky fold-up tablet, there are kind of similarities to the whole iPad and tablet environment. Once again, I think very interesting, especially if you consider that this was done in 1987. So that was three years after the introduction of the original Macintosh and it was three years before the release of Windows 3.0. So just to contextualize the moment in time when this was done. And one of the people who was involved in the creation of this video was Hugh Doubley. He was one of the producers and designers for this video. And he later observed that these videos became a sort of management tool. They suggested that Apple had a vision of the future and they prompted a popular internal myth that the company was inventing the future. So these kinds of science fiction 
depictions of technology. They can serve a very important purpose for inspiration, for communicating a vision to serve as a management tool to basically get all people on board and on track to follow the same vision. And of course, they're also very, very useful as a kind of marketing tool, as a marketing tool to the outside to tell the world or to show the world that you are a leader in innovation and that you're at the forefront of technological innovation. And these kinds of videos are still popular and going strong and I just want to show you another example because I think it's a very well done video and this one is from Microsoft, it's called Productivity Future Vision and it is from 2011. So once again I'm astonished to look back at all the things that have actually come to fruition in this time frame. Things that back then were pure science fiction but that actually exist today. And at the same time there's still a lot of stuff in this kind of vision that doesn't exist today. I think most obviously the devices that they are using, they are all these floaty screens without any physicality. They are basically just sheets of glass where pixels magically appear and that kind of thing looks really wonderful and really futuristic and it's something that unfortunately isn't possible today. So I think it's interesting also to look back at these videos and to think about what are the things that have come to fruition, what are the things that have not manifested themselves, and if they haven't manifested themselves yet, will they perhaps, or are there good reasons why they haven't? At the same time, I also find this video kind of disappointing, actually, and I find it rather disappointing because, first, it is really quite boring, actually, because it doesn't have any kind of interesting story, it's just people using computers without any particular reason, without any story. But that's not my main disappointment. My main disappointment with this kind of video is that they are all depictions of shiny, perfect utopias. They are depictions of a world where everything is perfect and where there are no problems. All the people in these videos, they are young and they are healthy and they are well-dressed and they are good-looking and they are incredibly successful and probably very rich and no one is poor or old or anything else that isn't desirable. And also the kinds of technologies that you see in there, they also all work perfectly. And I guess we all know that technology doesn't just always work perfectly because in reality the Wi-Fi connection drops out or you grab your smartphone and suddenly you don't have any cellular reception or you drop your phone and suddenly the glass front is damaged or the batteries of your laptop run out or stuff like that. It's just a lot of technological failures and of course those kind of technological shortcomings and technological failures they never have any space or room in these kinds of videos. So I think in that regard these videos are both very boring and also limited in their value. I mean it's of course perfectly understandable that they are the way that they are because Microsoft is doing these things as a kind of marketing tool and they don't want to produce anything controversial, they don't want to use anything that could throw a bad light on them, but at the same time I think it really limits their ambition that the, everything is glossy and shiny and perfect. And this brings me to the fourth kind of purpose or utility that science fiction can fulfill and that is science fiction as a tool for reflection. And This is something that I think Ursula K. Le Guin expressed very well when she said that the purpose of a thought experiment and by extension science fiction is not to predict the future but to describe reality, the present world. And I think that's probably the most useful way to think about or to use science fiction as a critical tool for thinking and analysis in a design process or in any kind of creative process. And this is also something that Bell and Durish again picked up on when they said that we need a Ubicomp of the present which takes the messiness of everyday life as a central theme. The messiness of everyday life being the, the central construct here. A kind of reflection that takes into account that technology isn't perfect, that people aren't perfect, that our world isn't perfect and that we have to deal with these imperfections and that we can't just ignore them or gloss over them. And I just want to show you one video and this one is by an artist and technologist. His name is Keiji Matsuda. I think he's an architect by training but he's doing a lot of work in the technology space now and he's producing a lot of really great design fiction video pieces and I just want to show you one very very short early work from him. This is a very early video from him that I think is a very good illustration of how a science fiction video can be used for critical reflection on a, a difficult or challenging topic. 
And I also would advise you to maybe turn down your speakers a bit if they are very loud because the sound is rather harsh. Cup of tea. Fill kettle with two hot plates, one PG tips tea bag, and a clean mug. Good. Now get the skim milk from the refrigerator. Carefully pour boiling water into the mug. You're doing great. While you're waiting for the tea to brew, why not browse some recipe suggestions to help you decide on a dinner that will satisfy your so I think this is a very grim and very dark view of how augmented reality might play out if we take all the negative trends and all the negative tendencies that we can observe on the World Wide Web today with pervasive ad intrusions and privacy violations and if we take the trend that people are not willing to pay for services but instead they will succumb to an onslaught of advertising just so they can avoid paying for something and if we take this, this status quo that's very much a reality if we look at the World Wide Web today and we transpose this reality into a vision of what augmented reality interfaces might look like, then we end up with this kind of dystopic vision as shown in this video, where the protagonist is just constantly barraged by this onslaught of advertising and he can, for a short period, turn it down to zone out and to relax a bit and then at the very end he tunes it back up so that he can save up some credit for other purposes and other tasks and stuff like that. And you have other shortcomings, like you have all those glitches and those tracking errors where the augmented reality overlay isn't functioning properly. But the most interesting detail in this video for me is, I'm not sure if it's that obvious, but maybe you noticed the kind of task that the person in the video was doing was he wanted to just make a cup of tea but he didn't have the capacity to do so on his own. Instead, he needed to look up a recipe for tea, which, as you know, is basically just boiled water. He needed to look up the recipe for tea on the internet so that he was able to fulfill this task. So it also hints at this complete loss of autonomy and this complete loss of agency that is a risk when you are constantly embedded in this virtual environment where every kind of information is at your fingertips and where you just become too lazy to know and to remember anything. And maybe that's not a problem because if you can look anything up then maybe we don't need to know anything but still I think it's a very strong critical viewpoint that's very subtly embedded in this video. Okay so science fiction can be understood as a tool for prototyping. I think this is something that once again Burish and Bell describe rather well when they say that science fiction visions appear as prototypes for technological environments. So basically science fiction visions are a way of envisioning the world surrounding those technological interventions that we might want to explore or critically reflect on. And Brian David Johnson in his book actually goes one step further when he says that basically every kind of prototype that we can build is a story or a fictional depiction of a product. Because the prototype that we build is not the actual thing that we want to build, but rather they are a story or fiction 
about the thing that we hope to build. And we then use these fictions to get our minds around what that thing might one day be. And we also use it to explain together what we hope to build. So once again, going back to this part that I was talking about before with science fiction, as a management tool, as a tool for establishing a shared vision, as Brian David Johnson also points out here. The interesting thing about technology is that what human beings do with a new technology is usually far more interesting than the technology itself. Because it tells us something about the human condition. It tells us something about us. It tells us something about humanity. And the truly interesting thing about new technologies isn't the technology itself usually, but rather how these new technologies expand the range of possible human behaviors. And in that sense, science fiction prototyping can be very useful to make this step beyond the technological parts or the technological aspects and to use it as a tool to think about how a new technology can change the range of human behaviors, of human capabilities. Frederick Pohl, a science fiction author, also once said a very, very good sentence in line with that when he said that a good science fiction story should be able to predict not the automobile, but the traffic jam. So basically, he's saying that the interesting thing here isn't the automobile as a, a technological artifact, as a new tool that expands human mobility, but rather the implications that arise from these changes in human mobility, like how it might influence how we build our cities and how we choose places to live and also how we spend our time in cars and are willing to sit in traffic jams in order to move from point A to point B. Okay. So basically, I think science fiction prototyping is best understood as a storytelling technique. So it's basically a storytelling tool. So when we're talking about science fiction prototyping, we're talking about fiction as in storytelling and not fiction as in not yet real. The thing that makes science fiction prototyping interesting as a tool in a design process isn't the imaginary part, the, the making stuff up part, the stuff that isn't real. The way that fiction is best understood as a prototyping tool is as a storytelling tool to tell stories about technological change and to tell stories about technological interventions and to use it once again as a tool for critical reflection and to explore the ramifications of a technology, to explore how it changes humans, how it changes life, how it changes society. So science fiction prototypes are typically stories and they can be told in a variety of different media, for example, short stories or movies or comics or storyboards or whatever. So there are a lot of legitimate ways to express those science fiction prototypes. And usually they are built around exploring the implications or the ramifications of a particular technology. David Kirby described these kinds of science fiction prototypes as diegetic prototypes. Diegesis is the concept of exploring the internal world that is created by a story and that the characters within that story and the characters within this imaginary world themselves experience and encounter. It is, if you will, the narrative space that includes all the parts of the story, both those that are seen and those that are not actually seen on the screen or described in the text of the story. So, for example, this diegesis, the internal world, the narrative space includes events that have led up to the present action that's actually described in the story. It includes people who are being talked about. So, for example, if two characters talk about some other person that isn't part of the actual scenery, that's a kind of narrative space building, like a kind of narrative world building. And it also includes events that are presumed to have happened elsewhere or at a different time. And these diegetic prototypes have a major rhetorical advantage because in the process of this diegesis, these technologies exist as real objects that function properly and which people actually use. And that's the major 
advantage of these diegetic prototypes compared to other kinds of prototypes like proof of concept prototypes or technological prototypes that maybe explore some part of a functionality or that only describe the surface appearance of something because these other kinds of prototypes they usually don't assume that these technologies that are shown or that are modeled in these prototypes that they are actually used by people. So in some sense, these diegetic prototypes are probably the most comprehensive and the most elaborate way that you can explore a non-existing technological system and how it would function and work and operate in the real world when people start actually using it. Okay, so how would you actually go about crafting your own science fiction prototypes. Many stories follow a general formula or structure. That's probably something that you're also familiar with. For example, if we were talking about software development, then one popular way of using stories in our work is the concept of user stories that you're probably familiar with. And user stories are a way to document and describe requirements for software and for software artifacts. And these user stories can take different shapes or forms. You can see two examples here, two different examples here on this slide, but you usually pick one formula or one structure and then you write all your user stories in that form. So for example, a user story might have the shape of, in order to receive a particular benefit as a role, I want, goal or desire. And that's a formula, a structure that all your user stories can follow. Or another very, very popular and well-known framework for storytelling is the 5W plus H framework that you're probably familiar with from school, that you probably learned in school, where basically people are taught that in order to comprehensively describe a situation, for example, when writing an article, you should try to answer these six questions. You should try to answer who, where, when, what, why, and how. And if you manage to answer these six questions, then you can provide a, a comprehensive description of an event, for example, in an article or in a story that you should write. And when we are talking about the structure of stories, then it's also important to separate two different parts of this, the idea of a story and the plot of a story. And the plot is the events, the actions that move a story forward. So basically a plot moves the story along from initial conflict to its resolution and it's the actions that are typically motivated by elements of the core idea of a story. And the idea is basically what the story is actually about. It's the central theme. It's what the author of a story actually wants to express or explore in his work, in his writing or in his movie or whatever. So if we take a movie like Minority Report, once again, maybe if you've seen the movie, then you remember the basic plot of Minority Report is actually a rather typical and a rather conventional crime thriller story where Tom Cruise, the main character, is charged with a crime and then he goes on the run and is chased by the police and chased by this oppressive police state and he, he tries to get away and prove his innocence. So that's actually a rather conventional and rather typical crime thriller story, the plot of this. But in the background there are actually much more ambitious and much more complex philosophical themes that are explored in this movie. So basically the film's central theme is actually the question of free will versus determinism. So it actually examines whether free will can exist at all or if the future is set in stone and known in advance. So that's like one, one enormous philosophical question. And it's one of the central questions that the main character, Tom Cruise, in the movie is struggling with. And aside from this central theme of free will versus predetermined fate, there are also other more complex or more ambitious themes that are explored. For example, how far can a government go in protecting its civilians and how much freedom are people required to give up in order for their government to protect them. It explores themes of universal surveillance. It explores complex questions around a police state that surveils its populace and where the government has very wide-ranging authority to, on the one hand, protect, but also 
control its citizens. So those are very complex themes that are actually explored in this movie, despite its rather pedestrian crime thriller plot. Okay, one of the main components to make a plot interesting and compelling is conflict. So every story, every interesting story, every exciting story probably requires some sort of conflict to create tension and to create an interest in the story by adding uncertainty about the outcome, to, by adding some element of uncertainty about how this will develop and what the end result will be. And basically there are four main sources of conflict in storytelling. There's human versus human conflict, there's human against society, there's human against nature, and there's human against self. And human against human conflict is probably one of the most widely used and widely understood conflicts in storytelling. It's basically your typical hero against villain, it's protagonist against antagonist conflict. It's basically what you have in every superhero movie, in every Marvel movie. It's Luke Skywalker versus Darth Vader. It's what you have in every James Bond movie, in every action movie. So that's a very, very common source of conflict. But you don't just have this conflict human against human in action movies or in violent movies where there's some kind of violent conflict, but you also have it in much more peaceful kinds of stories. For example, if you think about romantic comedies, even in a romantic comedy movie where you have two people where you know right from the beginning that they will fall in love and they will end up together. Even in those kinds of stories, you usually have some conflict in the middle where it's uncertain whether they will actually find to each other. So even in these very wholesome or harmonious kinds of movies like a romantic comedy, you very often find this conflict of human against human in their struggle to find each other before they reach their happy end. And then there is also another source of conflict that's very common in science fiction, I think, and that's human against society. So that's basically every kind of story where we critically reflect on societal implications. And that's, of course, very interesting in science fiction because science fiction stories very often explore societal implications of some kind of technological development or even societal development. And that's what we have, for example, in books like Fahrenheit 451 or in 1984 and stuff like that. So that's also a very common theme in science fiction. And I think it's also very useful for this kind of science fiction prototyping, because going back to this idea of the diegetic prototypes, I think, of course, it's very interesting to use science fiction prototyping as a means of exploring those societal ramifications and societal implications of a new technology. And then the third main source of conflict in storytelling is human against nature. And that's basically all your survival stories like Robinson Crusoe or Moby Dick or also disaster movies like your typical Roland Emmerich disaster movie. Those are human against nature. Nature as a violent force and the human struggle for survival against nature. And then finally, the fourth main source of conflict in storytelling is human against self. And that's basically some protagonist, some hero, some main character st struggling with himself. And very often that's in combination with some kind of mental health struggle or also struggles with addiction. So, for example, something like Fight Club with Edward Norton and Brad Pitt, that would be a great example of a movie with a human against self narrative conflict or something like The Hulk in the Marvel Universe or Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and stuff like that. So you typically always need some kind of central conflict in your stories to make them interesting and compelling because otherwise people won't care and it's just not very interesting <laughs> to follow along as a viewer or as a reader. And then once you've identified your central conflict that you want to explore, you can start building your story according to some structure, to some formula. And there are many, many different models to explain different story structures. For example, Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey is very, very popular and also very famous. Or you have something like Blake Snyder's Save the Cat, which is a best-selling book on screenwriting and novel writing. And he also has a lot of suggestions on how to structure your story. But I want to propose to you today the seven-point plot structure, story structure by Algis Budris. And this is a story structure that was proposed or developed particularly for short stories and for novellas. So you probably don't want to use this story structure for something very long, like a several hundred pages long novel, but for a short story, the seven point plot story structure probably works quite well. 
And he proposes that you structure your story along those seven points. You basically start with these different questions or points that you get to fill out. You have a person in a place. So that's your main character, your protagonist in a particular environment. And this person in a place has a problem. The challenge that they are confronted with, the source of conflict, the, the initial source of conflict, if you will. And this person then intelligently tries to solve the problem and fails. And things get worse until you reach a certain climax. And after the climax, you have a particular outcome. And this climax can be both good or bad. It can be both a success or it can be a failure. It's just a culmination of the story where you basically resolve the problem where you resolve the conflict one way or another and it doesn't have to be a positive resolution. It can result in both success or failure and then depending on success or failure you can reflect on this climax in the outcome of the story. So that's basically a very simple structure, a very simple formula that you can follow when you're trying to construct a story that you want to tell. And then the next question is, now that we have this structure for our story, how do we inject the science and technology part into this story. And here, Brian David Johnson proposes this five-step process where he suggests that first you pick a particular science or a particular technology and build the world. You think about who's the main character, where do they live, when do they live, basically the setup, the framework where your story happens in. And then you insert a specific technology inflection point. So you pick a technology that you are excited about or that you're worried about and you inject this technology into the story and see what happens and you explore the ramifications. What are the consequences of this inflection or what are the consequences of this conflict and how are the characters or setting affected? Then you insert the human inflection point, which is basically how does the main character of your story adapt to what is going on and how do they change and how do they act based on these technological ramifications. And then you reveal what we have learned. How does the setting or main character change as a result of their reaction or interaction with the technology? So basically you have something like the seven point plot structure here in the middle, a person in a place which corresponds to the world building part in the Brian David Johnson science fiction prototyping process. This person has a problem which corresponds to the technology inflection point in Brian David Johnson's model. The person intelligently tries to solve the problem and fails and things get worse. So that corresponds to the exploration of ramifications for a character or the world that the character is existing in. Then you have the climax, which is basically the human inflection point. That is basically the point where you explore how does the main character, how does the protagonist deal with those technological ramifications and with this conflict and what's happening in the story. And then in the end, you explore the outcome and reveal what you have learned. So basically, that's how you could go about developing your science fiction prototype as a story. And yeah, a few questions to get you started with. So some of the things that you might want to start thinking about when, when trying to build these kinds of science fiction prototypes is what are the implications of the mass adoption of a technology? Going back to what, what I said earlier, that people tend to overestimate the short-term effects of new technology and to underestimate the long-term effects. That's one of the questions to address this kind of short-sightedness or this imbalance in predictions to start thinking about, okay, what actually happens when every person on earth or every second person on earth starts using this technology? And you can start with questions like worst case scenarios. What's the worst thing that could possibly go wrong and how would it affect the people and locations in the story? You can think about best case scenarios. You can think about what's the best thing that could happen and how would it better the lives of people in the story. And finally, if this technology was in an average home, in every home out there, how would it actually work? How would people actually deal with this technology? How would they actually use it. So in conclusion, science fiction as a tool for designers and technologists can serve a number of different 
goals and purposes. It is a tool for prediction, for making predictions about the future. It is a tool for inspiration to provide guidance, to establish a shared vision of how things might proceed, of what the future might look like, but also to think about the implications and ramifications of new technology. It can be a tool for marketing to sell your particular vision of a future to a wider audience or as a management tool inside a company. It is especially a tool for critical reflection to think about the wider ramifications of a new technology, also to think about the challenges or downsides that a new technology might bring. And finally, I think the most immediate value of science fiction as a tool is for ideation and prototyping as a designer and as a technologist. So with that, thank you for your attention.